I have seven grandkids. Ha, we have, you know, I've, well, I also know that, uh, you know, during my childhood and during our children's early life and now our grandkids, that Easter was always a big deal, a lot of fun to hunt for Easter eggs. And if you were going to say anything about a food in association with Easter, I think you'd pick the egg. And uh, so that, that's why I titled this eggs, eggs are for Easter at most. And I know a lot of you have eggs left over from your grandkids from yesterday. Hopefully when we get done with this presentation, you'll dump them down to the garbage disposal or maybe not, but that's the intention. What, what do we do? Take a picture of them first. Oh yeah, Mary said take some pretty pictures. We had our grandkids over yesterday and we dyed uh, eggs and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it, but you know, they're still in the carton. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go. Well, this is uh, eggs are for Easter at most, and this is a frank discussion a doctor should have with everyone about eating eggs. You should be told the truth, and we're going to talk about telling the truth as far as eggs are concerned. Uh, the American Egg Board's mission. This is an organization that's set out to support Americans, egg farmers and to increase the demand for eggs and eggs products. And they've done a good job. Almost 15 eggs per month is the average intake for people in the United States. And they spend annually $22 million to promote their products. And between 2007 and 2017, in other words, over a 10 year period of time, they spent $222 million to get you to buy eggs. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, six different claims that the egg industry and their proponents make about eating eggs. And we'll go through those pretty much one by one, and I'll show you what I understand to be the truth. They tell you whole eggs are among the most nutritious foods on earth. They're just chock full of nutrients. Well, nutrients you can get better from other places, as we'll discuss. Eggs, eggs improve your cholesterol profile and do not raise your risk of heart disease. That's a good one, especially since they're the, the, the highest cholesterol food that anybody eats. Eggs are loaded with choline, which they say is an important nutrient, particularly for the brain. And then they invoke little children to get your attention and sympathy and talk about the development of your child's brain and how important it is to have choline. And of course, Eggs are a rich source of choline. Eggs uh, contain high quality proteins with a perfect amino acid pattern. Eggs are loaded with lutein and zeanthalin, which protect the eyes. And those two nutrients do protect the eyes, but there are safer ways to get those nutrients as I'll show you than to consume eggs. And eggs for breakfast, they say, can help you lose weight. Boy, I bet that is very attractive to so many people because obesity and being overweight is an epidemic with 80% of people in a country like the United States fighting both those problems. Eggs provide ideal nutrition. They do for a pre-hatched chick. I mean, think about it. You join a cock sperm with a hen's ovum. In other words, an egg and a sperm we joined together in a, in a hen's body and they produce an egg which has all the, the components to make beaks and eyes and spleens and livers and legs and feathers and tails. A complete chicken is all the ingredients are within this one unit that's a, an ounce and a half package of ingredients. It's a absolute miracle, you know, full of loads of nutrients. It's, it's one of nature's most nutritious creations, they say. And egg is the richest foods of all. But you know, that's the problem that we have in Western developed countries is that we eat too much, too much calories, too much food, too much protein, too much fat, too much cholesterol. We, we suffer from diseases of overnutrition, not undernutrition, it's not starvation anymore. It's diseases of overnutrition that people suffer from in developed countries. Too much of a good thing for people, and it results in heart disease, type two diabetes, various kinds of cancers, constipation, all kinds of problems. 
The sales pitch though, and the primary sales pitch for the egg industry is that an egg is chock full of nutrients. It is enough of nutrients to grow an entire chick. The lines of evidence proving excess cholesterol is toxic. The egg industry says, no, they say eggs won't give you heart disease. You don't have to worry about the cholesterol because eggs don't raise cholesterol. That's what the egg industry tells you. Well, the lines of evidence that prove that cholesterol is toxic comes in three forms, animal studies, epidemiologic evidence, and clinical studies. The animal study started in 1913, where this scientist fed rabbits, poultry, dairy, beef, and other types of foods that aren't intended for rabbits. And these animals, which by the way, have a similar metabolism and nutrition to human beings, you know, both of us being herbivores, they develop profound atherosclerosis. They develop plaque disease that build up in the arteries. And it was uh, due to feeding an animal that was not designed to eat these animal foods by feeding them animal foods. Now there are animals that are designed to eat animal foods. There are omnivores and there are carnivores. Omnivores being your dog, carnivore being your cat. They have a metabolism set up ideally for handling these kinds of foods. You cannot cause atherosclerosis in a, a dog or a cat. You can just feed them loads of, you can feed them egg yolks all day long. And they just, they just crank up their liver metabolism and they get rid of the excess cholesterol. But you know, people, guinea pigs, uh, lesser primates, we don't have that kind of metabolism. We're designed to eat plant foods. And so when we take excess cholesterol, what I mean by that is the cholesterol that we eat above and beyond the cholesterol that we make, we make cholesterol, we make about 500 milligrams a day. Say we take in an extra 500 milligrams, we don't have the processing that goes through the liver to get rid of that excess 500 milligrams that we ate in our food. So if you can't get rid of it, what happens to it? It gets deposited. It gets deposited in the arteries. It gets deposited in the skin. You get xanth xantholasma and xanthomas because we can't get rid of it because it's not our food. The epidemiologic evidence comes from looking at the worldwide picture. We find country by country, you look at the cholesterol consumption and the death rate from heart disease, you find a straight line correlation. Wealthy countries, westernized countries, developed countries, whatever you wanna call them, take in loads of cholesterol. They're rich people, they eat rich food. And they have high blood cholesterols and high rates of heart disease. Whereas less developed countries, and they're rapidly vanishing. You know, it used to be you could count on China, Japan, Vietnam, countries in Africa, rural Africa especially, eating a diet that uh, was low cholesterol, a starch-based diet. And they had very little to no heart disease at all. Their cholesterol level stayed low, say uh, lower than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Whereas the average cholesterol in uh, wealthy countries is about 210 milligrams per deciliter. And the uh, third, line of evidence that proves that cholesterol, eating cholesterol, raises cholesterol and causes heart disease, comes from studies where we feed human subjects high cholesterol diets. And we do that by feeding them eggs and egg yolks. I mean, that, that's the classic food used to show that you raise your cholesterol tremendously. Like in this case, you see one individual and you see this individual on a cholesterol-free diet runs a blood cholesterol of say 150, 160 milligrams per deciliter. And then they feed them, well, it's a lot of eggs. It's about 10 eggs a day. It's uh, uh, 2,400 milligrams of cholesterol. And what happens in a matter of just a few days, the blood cholesterol rises to like 265, 270 milligrams per deciliter. And then the subject goes on a low cholesterol diet, in fact, a cholesterol-free diet, and precipitously drops their blood cholesterol, just like we find in our research studies that are done on our clinic patients. We find an average drop in blood cholesterol in seven days is 22 milligrams per deciliter. 
That's in a group that starts with an average cholesterol around 210 milligrams per deciliter. And they drop their cholesterol levels to, well, on average, about 180 to 190 just in one week. Now, uh, what you hear depends upon financial interests and politics. In uh, 1968, the Federal Trade Commission uh, filed a legal action against the egg, egg industry for false advertising. And their, their lawsuit was upheld by the US Supreme Court. They were accused of false advertising in 1968, misleading and false advertising. And they were guilty. Well, they fought back. Uh, the Egg Nutrition Center, you know, the egg industry. They went to the Select Committee on Nutrition in 1977. This is the Dietary Goals of the United States, the McGovern Report. In 1977, along with other lobbyists from the animal food industry, the beef industry, the dairy industry, what they did is they got together with their lobbyists and their money and they changed the dietary guidelines. In February of 1997, the guidelines said, you've got to cut out eating these foods or reduce greatly the consumption and you'll reduce your risk of heart disease and cancer and obesity. They said that. Well, by the end of 1977, because of uh, industry influence, they changed the entire dietary goals of the United States. Well, you know, science tells a true story and consistent story as was published in uh, Time magazine, this article upset the egg industry terribly. When in 1984, they told the American public that cholesterol is bad for you. Well, again, uh, industry has been fighting back and they fought back so cleverly, so effectively because of the great financial support they have so that they changed the dietary guidelines for Americans, which are published every five years. The guidelines of 2015 to 2020. Okay, these are the guidelines uh, that we're living by, well, 220 to 225, I guess are the current ones. But these were the guidelines just before us. They, they said in these guidelines, they said, cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. That was, that was how influential industry can be as they got they got the dietary guidelines for Americans to change their recommendation on eating eggs and cholesterol. Well, we, we sued them. You know, the Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine, along with my help, we filed this lawsuit. And this was in, you, right afterwards, 2016, we filed a lawsuit, which was filed in California, which didn't really go any place. There were a whole bunch of reasons why it didn't, but we sued them for false advertising. It's money. It's just money, folks. All right. Well, eggs are known to be uh, high in cholesterol. They're, they have eight times more cholesterol than beef does. The, they're the most cholesterol-concentrated food of anything we eat. A plant foods contain virtually no cholesterol, whereas eggs, 272 milligrams per, per 100 calories beef, 33 milligrams, chicken. And you should note this, that the cholesterol content of various muscles, whether they move a limb, i.e. cow, flap a wing, i.e. bird, or wiggle a tail, we're talking about fish. The cholesterol content of all these muscles are the same. And the rate of blood cholesterol in people about the same when you do it on a weight basis. If you do it per calorie, you find fish has more cholesterol than beef and poultry. So industry fights back and they do it by producing scientific data that they get published in our best medical journals. This is one of the most recent studies that was published in 2021 in the Journal of Nutrition, which is heavily influenced by industry. I know this. And what they showed is feeding two eggs a day to subjects on a plant-based diet. It didn't raise their fasting blood sugar. And I want you to remember that fasting blood sugar was not raised. And you know, it was, it was a bit of a mystery as to why 
feeding two eggs a day, which is about uh, 400 milligrams of cholesterol. Wh why, why did they ra raise blood cholesterol levels? Well, my suspicions were raised by the fact that this study was supported by the American Egg Board, the Egg Nutrition Center. It's supported by the egg industry. So do you think they're going to pay for studies that don't promote their products? Maybe once they do, but they're not going to do it twice. They're not going to hire the same scientists again. I guarantee it. Remember, they have $22 million a year to spend buying scientific research if they choose to do it. That's just for eggs. So when you look at the, uh, the funding of scientific research by various industries, what you find is this is you find cholesterol is increased in the studies in 93% of the non-industry funded studies. The industry funded studies, 86% uh, show a rise in cholesterol. But if you look at the studies, if you look at the research and the, the conclusions, the actual raw data, and then you compare that to what the study generally told the public, what you found was there was discordance between the findings and what they came to the conclusions about in 49% of the industry funded studies, but only 13% of the non-industry funded studies. In other words, they got results that feeding eggs raised blood cholesterol, and then they sugarcoated it. You know, then they spun the data, then they told a lie to the public and unsuspecting physicians and scientists who don't take the trouble to read the research. So what they found on average is that feeding eggs raise the blood cholesterol by 5.6 milligrams per deciliter. By the way, I want you to notice before 1980, there were no industry funded studies. You might remember that fact that before, and I own it's only since 1980 that industry has gotten their, their dirty hands into the business of buying advertisements by doing and publishing scientific research. You know, that's what industry does. And they discovered that they could get away with it. Not just, not just the food industry, the beef, the pork, the fish industries, the egg industries, but also the, the drug industries. You know, when I used to read my scientific journals, and I, I still read a lot of scientific journals, but, but, you know, back in my more naive days, I would read a journal like the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what I'd find is the, the first part of the journal had about, uh, about 15 pages of highly colorful ads for drugs and food. And I thought to myself, how stupid. You know, everybody knows these are advertisements. And then at the end of the journal, they'd have another few pages of blatantly advertising pages. And in between were the scientific studies. It wasn't until I started reading the scientific studies that I realized that the real advertisements were in the middle. They were the research. When you, when you take it, you do a study, you can convince doctors in particular that it must be true. But if you do false studies as they do, studies designed to show benefits for their product, what do you expect? The advertisement is in the middle of the journal in the scientific research presented. So one of the tricks on, on how, you, uh, how you do an experiment where you don't see a rise in blood cholesterol is first what you do is you saturate your subjects with cholesterol from other sources like chicken, fish, beef. And then what you do is you feed cholesterol to the subjects and because you've saturated their absorptive capacity in their gut to the point where you can't absorb any more cholesterol. You don't see a rise of blood cholesterol by starting out your experiment by that. So what they found is that uh, studies that uh, fed somewhere between 400 and 800 milligrams of cholesterol a day. And remember I told you that the average uh, consumption of cholesterol is around 500 milligrams. So you just pick anybody off the street for the study. Uh, adding extra cholesterol say a thousand milligrams of, of cholesterol, say four eggs a day. You don't get any rise in cholesterol. So you've already saturated the absorptive sites in the gut. And scientists knew this. 
back in the early 80s. We knew this. How'd they trick us? Well, in experiments that don't try and trick you, like for example, this one by Frank Sachs, what he did is he took uh, 17 lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto-vegetarians, so there were no eggs, college students whose uh, average cholesterol intake was uh, 97 milligrams a day. And he fed them one extra large egg daily three times a week. And it raised the bad cholesterol, which is the important cholesterol by 12%. And they knew, and they told, told us in this study, they, they told you what I just explained to you in the last slide. They said egg consumption is reported to produce less of a rise in serum cholesterol when added to high cholesterol diets than when added to a lower modern cholesterol diet. So, you know, competent researchers, they understand how the egg industry tricks people. The, the next trick they use is, is this one. Uh, this is the rise in cholesterol over time, over a seven hour period of time. And what you see is when you feed high cholesterol, in this case, you see the, the, round, uh, the, the round circles that represent the line where people consume a high amount of cholesterol. They're consuming about three eggs a day, maybe four, 710 milligrams of cholesterol a day. You see the, the high rise in blood cholesterol after they eat. You see how it goes up right like this, way up after post we we call that after meals, way up stays up for a long period of time, and then it comes down after about seven hours to a fasting state. Well, it comes down to a fasting state, which would be similar to what you get if you feed a low cholesterol diet. So you have this whole period of time, you know, you have five, six hours where the blood cholesterol level is elevated markedly after the subjects eat, but you know, after six or seven hours, what happens in a fasting state? is the fasting blood sugar or fasting blood cholesterol that you measure with your lab tests. And remember, the study looked at fasting cholesterol levels. It said so in the paper, I just showed you that the fasting level, it comes down to, well, what we call consider normal or before testing. And considering the way that people eat, they're always in a postprandial state. They eat three, four times a day. So they are always in a state where they have an elevated blood cholesterol. You gotta get them to stop eating for a period of at least seven hours before you see a fasting cholesterol. So they're running this, this highly toxic cholesterol levels in their bloodstream for most of the day, all the day, if you happen to be a typical American, meal after meal after meal. Maybe you, you sleep for eight hours and you get yourself in a fasting state then. But the rest of the day, you're in a postperandial, in other words, post-meal, condition. And research says, it says that angiogenesis, in other words, the creation of damage to the arteries, atherosclerosis, may occur during the postperannual period. Uh, this isn't too hard to figure out. I mean, it was described in 1910 that these plaques, they're made of cholesterol. So that's the second way they trick you is they just present a fasting blood cholesterol level and they ignore completely the period of time after you eat where your cholesterols are exaggerated high and damaging levels. Well, you know, your blood cholesterol is interesting and, and it's important only in how it relates to how long will I live? I mean, that's what you're concerned about. You don't care if you have a high cholesterol level, do you? As long as you live a long time and in good health, how will I avoid cancer? That's what you care about. You know, how will I avoid heart disease? These are the real truths that count, aren't they? Well, let's take a look at uh, current and very important research that's been done addressing these particular issues. Here's one out of the Public Library of Science Medicine. The most respected unbiased journal that's published. And the title of the article is Egg and Cholesterol Consumption and Mortality from Cardiovascular and Different Causes in the United States, a population-based study. And their conclusion in this study, intakes of eggs and cholesterol were associated with higher all-cause mortality, in other words, death, cardiovascular diseases and cancer. And they also said in there something really important that we've already talked about that I wanna refer you back to 
And that is the current recommendations for, for egg and dietary cholesterol intake from the US dietary guidelines. Remember, I told you 2015 to 2020, the guidelines were influenced by industry. So they said that it, the cholesterol that you eat are, is not important. This is a nutrient of no concern. And so this, this study was published in reaction to that, to try and tell the public the truth. So what the US dietary guidelines published in 2015 to 2020 in the guidelines might lead to increases in cholesterol intake, which could be detrimental to the prevention of premature death. That's what you're concerned about. And then in 2019, the Journal of the American Medical Association, they published again, another landmark study. The Association of Dietary Cholesterol and Egg Consumption with the Incident Cardiovascular Mortality. For each half an egg consumed per day, people had a 6% higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease and an 8% risk of death over a 17 period year of time, 17 year period of time. And the, the graphs that you see here look at zero intake and uh, versus taking two and a half eggs a day. And you see this dramatic increase in death from heart disease and developing heart disease. That's what you care about. So the research is clear. Eggs kill. All right. How do you counter some of the sales pitches? How do you counter unique positioning? Unique positioning, I talked to you a lot about this. This is unique positioning. What you do is you take, a, take a, something unique about your product and, and you promote it. Like for example, protein. If I say protein, you say meat. If I say calcium, what do you say? You know, the unique position that the dairy industry takes is calcium. And if I say omega-3 fats, what do you think the fish industry promotes? Something unique about fish. That is, it contains a lot of omega-3 fats. Even though the fish didn't make it, only plants make with omega-3 fats. And even though there's no such thing as protein or calcium deficiency on any natural diet, they promote that because that's what their products contain is a lot of protein and calcium. Unique positioning. And so the egg industry has some unique positions that they use to sell you their products. Uh, the primary unique positions used are protein because eggs are high in protein and choline. So let's, let's talk about each of these. Uh, as far as eggs being the perfect protein, it was proved in 1970 in a research study where they took people and they they determined how efficiently the protein was utilized. And they found out if you added potatoes to an egg diet, you improve the protein efficiency by 36%. In other words, a mixture of eggs and potatoes is more efficient at delivering protein than our eggs alone. So if eggs are the perfect protein, how in the world can you improve the utilization of the protein from eggs by adding potatoes. Well, they got caught lying again, didn't they? Excess protein is damaging. Uh, excess protein. When you when you eat protein, you need a little bit to you know grow cells and replace some of the hair that you have. And you know if you're you're in a growing period of time, you use a little bit of protein to grow. And if you get a bad injury, you use a little protein to repair the injury. But otherwise, and by the way, that's about 3% of your calories are dedicated to these maintenance uh, uh, duties that the, the body requires, about 3% of the calories. Well, the, the typical American diet can be 16% of the calories or, you know, when you eat something like the, the Atkins type diet, it can be 30, 40% protein. Well, what are you gonna do with that excess protein? In other words, the protein that you that you don't need to, re, to grow new cells, to replace hair, to grow. What are you gonna do with that extra protein? Well, if you stored the protein, it'd be stored in the muscles, wouldn't it? And we'd all look like Arnold Schwarzenegger used to look. You'd look out on the streets, you see a bunch of people that could enter bodybuilding contests. Is that what you see? You know, of course not, you see the opposite. People could never win a, a contest when they took off their clothes. So it's protein is never stored. 
Well, you have to do with the extra proteins, you have to get rid of it. And you get rid of it by initially metabolizing the protein in the liver. And then what happens is the protein is, is filtered through the kidneys. And in the process of filtering this extra protein through the kidneys, you increase the wear and tear on the kidneys. You increase the flows and the pressures in the nephrons of the kidneys, which causes damage to the kidneys and causes progressive kidney failure. Now, for most of us, this isn't very important because our kidneys are so overabundant in their ability to take care of metabolism that you have to lose 75% of your kidney mass before it becomes important. The average American, by the time they hit 70 years old, has lost 20% of their kidney mass by eating the Western diet. But still, you have to get down to 25% of kidney function before you can see anything. However, if you take somebody who has already lost kidney, say somebody who's gotten an auto accident and they've lost a kidney, or they don't eat a kidney, they lose half their kidney mass by giving a kidney to somebody else, don't they? Or, or they lose kidney mass through diabetes or atherosclerosis or infection. So say they, they end up with 50% or less kidney function, then that extra wear and tear caused by hope or by a a high protein diet, high protein intake, results in progressive rapid kidney failure. And the ultimate result is they end up in need of a dialysis machine or a kidney transplant sooner. And we've known that for a hundred years is that a low protein diet is the fundamental treatment for taking care of people with all kinds of kidney problems to stop or slow the progression of loss of kidneys. Okay, well, what happens is uh, when you eat the, when you feed a high protein diet, you're feeding protein, which is made up of amino acids. And the amino acids in, uh, in animal products uh, contain a lot of sulfur containing amino acids, which break down into sulfuric acid. And so you're taking this tremendous amount of acid and sulfur containing amino acids you create a, an acidic condition in the body and the bloodstream. Well, the body protects its acid-base balance precisely. In fact, if it doesn't, you die. And the pH of the body is a little bit alkaline, it's 7.4. So when you're eating all this acid, what happens is the body has to correct this intake of acid. And it does it by dissolving the bones. And the bones release al alkaline material well, in the process, you weaken the bones and the material of the bones, not just the minerals, calcium, but also the bone tissue is, is metabolized out of the bone and the bones become weakened, which results in a condition called osteoporosis, which you know, every, everybody fears and they should rightly. And that bone material ends up in the kidneys and solidifies into little pieces of bone called calcium kidney stones which almost all kidney stones in people living in Western worlds are made of, they're made up of calcium. You know, eating the, the high protein Western diet is essentially uh, peeing your bones into the toilet. So you try and sell me eggs on the fact that they're high in protein. I'll tell you what high in protein means. Here's the amino acids. We have a couple of sulfur containing amino acids. They'd be, uh, cysteine and methionine, these guys right here, you see the little yellow here? Okay, the little yellow is sulfur. And these are the sulfur containing amino acids which are so prevalent in animal foods, which break down to sulfuric acid. Let's talk about methionine. Let's talk about this amino acid, this sulfur containing amino acid. Uh, let's talk about mm, egg whites. You know, they, they push egg whites that the idea that you get rid of the yolk, which is high in fat and high in cholesterol. And so you're told that eating egg whites is safe. Egg whites are 100% protein. And the kind of protein that egg whites have uh, is dominated by sulfur containing amino acids. Uh, let's take a look at the methionine. Remember, that's a sulfur containing amino acid in various foods. For 100 calories, each of this is based on 100 calories. Pinto beans, 98 milligrams. Potatoes, 35. Rice, 52. Egg whites, 700.
whole eggs 251, beef 250, chicken 317, salmon 318. Okay, so what happens when you eat a, a lot of sulfur containing methionine amino acids? What happens? Well, we just talked about what happens to the bones. It leads to osteoporosis and kidney stones. I went over that in detail with you. Well, methionine is metabolized into homocysteine, and there was a big rage about homocysteine levels and whether or not you were going to get heart disease. The higher your homocysteine level, the greater your risk factor for getting heart disease because your homocysteine re level reflects how much of the animal foods you eat. So methionine is metabolized into homocysteine. Sulfur feeds cancer. In fact, it, when you do experiments, say in a Petri dish, you can't get cancer cells to grow unless you put methionine in the medium. If, if you make up your, your growth medium in a, say a Petri dish, Without methionine, if you use other sources of sulfur, like cysteine, the cancer won't grow if you leave the methionine out. The methionine is toxic to tissues, particularly the intestine. And because of the toxicity of these sulfide compounds, it's believed that it irritates the intestine and is one of the factors involved in inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. In experimental animals, restriction of methionine prolongs life. Methionine is a sulfur-containing amino acid. Sulfur stinks. The most obnoxious smell is rotten eggs because of the sulfur. When you went to, uh, when you went to Yellowstone National Park and you stood by the sulfur pits, it was disgusting. It was, it was repulsive because by nature, we are repulsed by sulfur. Well, when we eat large amounts of sulfur as we do when we eat animal foods, for example, beef has four times as much sulfur as do beans. We're talking about the same number of calories, the same amount of protein, four times as much methionine, sulfur containing amino acids. Chicken, seven times as much as, as corn. Tuna fish, 12 times as much as sweet potatoes. So you take in this large amount of sulfur and something has to happen with it. The sulfur that you eat, it's absorbed in your intestinal tract, goes into your bloodstream, floats around in the bloodstream. When it gets to the lungs, it's exhaled. That's how you have bad breath. In fact, if you go to your dentist, the test the dentist used is with a hell meter, which is an instrument where they stick a straw in your mouth and they have you exhale and it it checks how much uh, sulfur containing hydrogen sulfide is present in your breath, which stinks. We, we did an experiment at, at our clinic and over a seven day period of time, our, our dentist, he brought his hal meter over to the clinic and we measured participants on day one and day seven. And they decreased their sulfur in their breath by 50%, it was cut in half in seven days by getting this sulfur containing foods out of the diet. So this sulfur is exhaled out of the lungs. You can brush your teeth as much as you want, doesn't matter. You're still gonna be breathing it out. You're still gonna stink. The, some of the sulfur ends up uh, going through your skin and that's how you get BO. And then a large amount of sulfur ends up uh, at the end of the intestinal tract and that results in stinky flatus. Bad farts, meat stinks. You know, on our diet, you have lots of gas, but it smells okay. What did it used to smell like when you're eating the animal foods? It smelled like something died, didn't it? I mean, that's what you get from eating egg whites. Lots and lots of methionine, lots and lots of sulfur, which results in various sulfide compounds, hydrogen sulfide compounds, which cause a whole bunch of problems. So choline, they push choline. All right, choline is a, is a nutrient that's required by the body. And, and the first thing I wanna point out for you is that uh, the requirement for choline is 150 milligrams a day. For adults, that's children. For adults, it's uh, 500 milligrams a day. Uh, look at the, uh, the choline content of various foods. Eggs, yeah, they're very high in choline. Beef. High chicken, 
but soybeans are just as high. And potatoes, there's lots of there's lots of choline in potatoes, 57 milligrams per serving. Beans, 45. Quinoa. You know, quinoa has more choline than milk products, et cetera. You get plenty of choline in your vegetable foods. Choline deficiency is virtually unknown. It's never tested for in routine examinations. But you can get toxic from taking in too much choline. And an overdose of choline, if you feed uh, 1,000 milligrams to a child, that's seven eggs a day. And, you know, there are kids that eat seven eggs a day. I was probably one of them when I was a little kid. But with adults, uh, 300 milligrams of choline consumed, that's 20 eggs will result in toxicity overdose. And the toxicity is you stink like a fish, vomiting, excess salivation, hypotension, and liver toxicity. Now, you don't just get choline from foods. You also get choline from supplements. Uh, choline is uh, a component of phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylcholine which is a component of lecithin. You know lecithin, that's been promoted to you as a health food supplement, which you have been encouraged to either get from food, lots, lots of lecithin and eggs, and or you buy it as a supplement. Well, let's take a look at what happens when you take in choline. Okay, uh, choline, you look in the uh, upper left-hand corner, and you see consumption of, uh, of animal foods, in particular eggs. What happens is this choline goes into the intestinal tract. And if you happen to be a meat eater, you grow bacteria in your, in your intestinal tract that, are, that have the capability of ter, turning choline into trimethylamine. Now, if you're a vegan, you don't grow the bacteria to make this conversion. So you can feed choline to a vegan, then because of their bacteria, the kind of bacteria they have, you don't produce trimethylamine. Well, that trimethylamine is absorbed through the intestine and then it's metabolized in the liver into trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide is known to be one of the, the closest associations to whether or not you're gonna suffer from heart disease and die from heart disease. So that's what choline gives you. It gives you trimethylamine and trimethylamine oxide. Trimethylamine, by the way, it stinks. It's called uh, trimethylamine urea is a genetic condition called the fish odor syndrome. You smell like a fish. But trimethylamine oxide, it doesn't stink, but it damages your tissues all over the body. And particularly, we note the association of trimethylamine oxide with heart disease. Now, also carnitine, with carna, you know what carna stands for? It stands for, you know, carnivore, carna, meat. The carnitine will do the same thing. Both, both choline and carnitine will produce a condition where you can grow the bacteria when you eat meat. The bacteria that convert choline into trimethylamine, which results in trimethylamine oxide, which is toxic to the system. So the, the industry, the egg industry promoting choline, that's one of their biggest sales pitches. That's the unique position of eggs. They get so much choline in them. Hey, they didn't tell you the toxic side of the story, did they? Well, an another thing that they talk about is that you need to eat eggs because they have lots of lut lutein and xanthalin, which it was important for the macula of the eye. Well, you see the macula of the eye it, right here. It's uh, right there, uh, macular pigment. It, you see, it's, it's kind of yellowish, and that may reflect eggs, but it also could reflect potatoes. It reflects lutein. Lutein is, is, is kind of yellowish. Well, a, a better, safer source of lutein and xanthalin is your potato, your white potato. That's where you need to get this particular nutrient for eye health from, not, not from supplements as they try and sell you. But you need to get it from potatoes, not from eggs, which are toxic. You need to get it from potatoes. So again, their sales pitch is unfounded. All right, then uh, you know, the last point is they tell you if you eat eggs for, eggs for breakfast, you'll lose weight. What? How did that happen? Plan on gaining weight. Well, you eat whole eggs and yolks. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. 
you know, it goes from my fork and spoon to my uh, hips, from my lips to my hips. That's how the saying goes. The body stores this fat. It's the metabolic dollar for the day when there's no food available. That's what have fat is for. It goes so efficiently to your body fat that I can tell what kinds of fats you like to eat. If you like uh, trans fats, like are found in Crisco's and shortenings and margarines, then you're going to be full of trans fats when I biopsy your body fat. If you eat a lot of fish, you're going to be full of omega-3 fats when we biopsy your body fat. Olive oil, you'll be full of monounsaturated fats. Dairy products, you'll be full of what we call C15, C17 fats. Very characteristic of dairy products. All right, let's take a look at the uh, fat content of uh, whole eggs. Whole eggs, uh, 60 to 70% of the calories found in eggs are fat. Now, egg whites, they take the yolk out and you're left with a 100% protein, no fat. But the egg yolks, 70 to 80% of the calories are fat. Fat you eat, the fat you wear. You're just kidding yourself thinking that you're going to eat eggs and lose weight. So eggs are chock full of poisons. They don't tell you about this, but let's talk about it. Uh, eggs are one of the highest uh, sources of uh, PFA PFASs, which are uh, polyfloral alkaline substances. Okay, you may know these uh, under the term Teflon or nonstick cookware, because that's one of the sources of PFAs. They come uh, firefighting foams, water, grease, stain repellents are found, high levels of PSA, PFAs. These PFAs, they readily cross the placenta, they're detected in the cord blood, they have direct exposure to the fetus, and they're found in the breast milk. Now, high levels of PFAs in the blood, PFAS in the blood, suppress the immune system, cause reproductive and developmental harms, and they're associated with cancer and raising blood cholesterol. These are toxic, toxic environmental chemicals. Let's talk about another one that eggs are particularly plentiful in. Eggs, about 4% of the daily dioxin intake comes from eggs. You know, a bigger source of dioxin comes from dairy and meat. Well, uh, these dioxins, they cause serious damage. In the left-hand corner, I've, I've shown some of the studies that have been done on high levels of dioxin, you know, primarily from Agent Orange, you know, from our Vietnam, Vietnam conflict that we had a few decades back. Agent Orange turns into dioxins. And, and the kids uh, have suffered with growth retardation, and thyroid hormone problems, and behavioral disorders from the dioxin that they consume. And around the world, uh, waste burning incinerators, herbicides, paper bleaching, and PVC piping are, are major sources of dioxins. Now, I often get asked about, well, how about organic eggs? You know, compared to uh, commercially grown eggs where you put the chickens in tiny little pens. With organic farming, what you do in addition to feeding them healthier food is you give them free range. And as a result of their free range, what happens is they end up having more dioxin than would a commercially grown chicken. Why? Because in free range, what they do is they consume worms and insects and soil that's loaded with dioxin. So your free range chickens, you know, that's what they sell on your free range chickens, free range eggs are more contaminated with the dioxin than would be a commercial chicken egg. Another poison. Uh, the egg industry, what they do is they have a whole promotion on their website telling you how to control food allergies. And you, they should because eggs are one of the top causes of food allergy. Uh, in the United States, five tenths to two and a half percent of the young children have allergies to eggs. In Australia, it's approximately nine, nine percent. It's the second most common food allergy, allergen. Cosmo being the first. And it's all parts of the egg that people are allergic to. 
results in atopic dermatitis, esophagitis, enterocolitis, asthma, anaphylaxis, and a whole bunch of other things. And, and I want you to note there are all, all kinds of sources. I've, I've listed them in, you know, in, in five sentences, six sentences, uh, the different sources of, of egg that will cause allergies. You know, albumin, oven albumin, powdered eggs, et cetera. You can read the list. Bacterial infection. It's the law in the United States, it's not just a word of caution, it's the law that you have to refrigerate eggs because refrigeration inhibits the growth of salmonella. Salmonella uh, gets on the eggs, well, it gets on the eggs in, in the chicken for the same reason, but it gets on the eggs when the eggs are laid. Where does the egg, how does the egg come out of a chicken? It comes out through their cloaca. You know, they have a combination of their urinary tract and their fecal tract called a cloaca. And that's the way the egg comes out of a chicken. They poop it out. And in the process, the, uh, the egg gets contaminated with chicken poop, which is loaded with salmonella. So, you know, you wanna be careful about handling eggs, you wash them carefully, make sure they're clean and uncracked. I take that back about washing them because washing removes a protective mineral. You're not supposed to wash eggs. And you buy refrigerated eggs only, you keep them in the refrigerator to avoid salmonella infection. 142,000 people in the United States are infected every year with salmonella and 30 people die. You know, for most people, it's not that serious. You just get uh, diarrhea, fever, stomach cramps, but it's, you know, this is, this is called food poisoning. You know, 60,000 people a year in the United States suffer from food poisoning and a good share of them are from eggs. Well, one thing you might consider is using egg replacers. And we recommend egg replacers because your recipes require certain things. For replacement, for binding flowers and baking, we use egg replacer, which is flowers. It has nothing to do with eggs. Uh, egg replacers made by Energy Foods. For breakfast, you instead of scrambled eggs, you might try tofu scramble, or better yet, oatmeal. Uh, Eggless egg salad, we make that out of tofu or garbanzo beans. We have recipes, we have all kinds of recipes in our, in our list of 4,000 recipes that we provide free to people. Baking, you use a quarter cup of flaxseed meal with three cups of a cup of water to make a mixture that replaces eggs and baking. But what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna buy egg substitutes like egg beaters, second nature, or all whites, because they're just egg whites. Eggs are big business, folks. I told you that the egg industry started doing scientific studies in 1950. Well, here's an ad from 1950, uh, promoting eggs. Nutrition experts rate eggs as the most nearly perfect food. They were telling that in 1950, I was only three years old. Order extra eggs this week. It's been going on a long time. And, and then, then the egg industry, the egg board, the Egg Nutrition Board, they got involved in the whole situation and they carried this advertising to the extreme to the point where, where they're telling you from the egg industry things like, there's no need to avoid eggs on a heart healthy diet. They get away with lying until they are taken to task by the FDA and the Supreme Court and then they don't. An egg a day may keep heart disease away Eat your eggs, they're good for you. Well, there is a, a website that you might consider going to. It's called eggtruth.com. And then there, they give you the other side of the story. They give you a lot of the information that I gave you and more. So if you need more ammunition to convince people not to eat eggs and more ammunition so that you throw the eggs away that you, you found to put in your Easter basket yesterday, go to eggtruth.com and see what they have to say. Well, the, one, one last thing I have to tell you is about what we do, which is the McDougal program. And it's chock full of useful and honest information. 
And what, what we sell you is we sell you uh, support. We sell you a, a good diet, medical care, and 12-day program that we run over the internet. And if you're interested, if you have problems related to eating rich foods, like obesity and heart disease, and autoimmune diseases and high blood pressure and diabetes, and boy, oh boy, we could go on to pretty much every Amer American has these problems. That means we have a potential audience of 330 million people in the US and probably out of the 7 billion people that occupy the planet, probably about 4 billion of people need us. And we're ready to, we're ready to, to take up the task and help get through with it. Uh, you probably know about our results. Um, we have an average cholesterol drop in seven days of 22 milligrams per deciliter. We're able to get 90% uh, of people to uh, reduce or stop their medications, particularly their diabetes and their blood pressure medications. And 85% of people, when they're taught the McDougal program by our expert staff, 85% of people are still compliant at the end of the year. They love the program. They've seen so much benefit to it. And so if you're interested in this kind of medical care, healthcare education, then I'd encourage you to go to our website, which is drmcdougal.com.